So we are computing the displacement squared. No? We obtain this result plus expectation value of x squared. Now, this is not very nice, okay? Because, as a matter of fact, this is divergent, then <laughs> I would say. And the reason essentially is that, well, uh, because of the symmetries of the problem, they can be arbitrary distant. If you just move all the, all the ions, there is this invariance. And they, so if you consider the distance from the given points, then you can find something which is arbitrary distant. Okay? It's just the meaning of the quality that we are computed. It's not really uh, physical, I would say. So in order to, to remove this kind of uh, ambiguities, maybe we can just consider the, instead of the displacement xi squared, we remove the, uh, the position of the center of mass of the problem. Okay? And then we compute this kind of displacement. Because otherwise we have always this kind of divergence of the arbitrariness in the, in the position of the atoms. Okay. It's just okay, this is a pathology. Uh, this quantity actually is pathological independently of this, but I didn't want to actually uh, consider this kind of pathology. There is something else here, more interesting. So let's just, just consider this, just remove the contribution from the position of the central mass here. Let's consider this quantity. Instead of xi squared, xi minus x squared, okay? We are removing that. Let's do this. Okay? So, in this way, we are removing this infinite that is kind of a, not physically meaningful, I would say. And we end up with this expression here. So, this expression, and I, uh, we, we have seen before that this is just equal to 1 because of the commutator. So in the end, you have that is equal to the sum from, K, from K, uh, over K from 1 to N minus 1, or 1 over 2M capital N, omega sine of, uh, and so on. Yeah. What is this? This is uh, this is, uh, I can tell you the asymptotic result in the limit of large N, if you consider many I think this is asymptotic, yeah? Many, many oscillators. Mm -hmm. So this behaves as, as log n divided by pi m omega. Okay? This is just the result of the sum. Huh? If you write the sum and then you consider, you assume that n is large, then you find this expansion. Yeah? This is the leading term. So this term, yes? Sorry? Ah, the water bottle. Okay. <laughs> Log n over pi m omega. Yeah. Okay, the, the coefficients are not, are not important here. What you can see is that in the limit of large n, this approach is infinity. So as a matter of fact, even if we subtract the ground, the center of mass position, then we find that these atoms, these ions can be arbitrary, arbitrary distant from this uh, lattice uh, size. Okay. This is something that you don't find in higher dimension. In particular, if you solve the problem in 3D, then you find that they are close to the, to the lattice size. And this is why in 3D you can talk about solids. So they are close. Instead of here in 1D, but also in 2D, I guess. I'm not sure about 2D, because this is a quantum problem, but without that in 1D, they, they can be arbitrary, uh, far away on points. Yes? Does it have any link with the fact that you cannot find uh, any transition uh, in 1D? This is uh, somehow, well, we are, we are at the temperature equal to zero. There can be phase transition, temperature equal to zero. You can't have a finite temperature phase transition in 1D. And this is why one-dimensional system at temperature equal to zero are similar to uh, classical system in two dimensions at finite temperature. So you have this kind of correspondence. And in 2D, you can have phase transition, the easy model. Okay. 
the classicalism of the element, eh? not, not the quantum symmetry. Okay. So, well, so this one just to tell you something that diverge. But okay, maybe then we can, instead of uh, asking this kind of uh, displacement of the single atom with respect to the, to the lattice point, which was kind of an artificial point, we could actually uh, wondering what is the distance between two atoms, the, 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 uh, what is the, the displacement squared between two atoms. So I mean something like that, something like this. Okay. Yes. So this is useful, so I remove. I raise this one. It is not. No. So these other quantities, that was square. This one minus one. So you see that now we don't have any more the problem of the center of mass because it's the difference between two, two positions, basically meaningful, and uh, I mean uh, distance r. So two ions, so is the first ion with a one plus r, r i. Okay? And, uh, well, What's the meaning of this? Well, we are just saying if they are correlated. Because if this is if this is more, then this means that if this ions is to the right, if you want, of uh, the or lattice sides, it means that also this ions is to the right. So there is a correlation between them. Is if this is uh, uh, finite, hmm? you can expect. We. Well, the question is, is it finite in this one-dimensional model? <laughs> Let's see. At least all large distances. So we, uh, how can we compute this quantity? Well, the, 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 the idea is the same as before. So we use the, this ladder formalism, so the phonons. And now this is more complicated than before because we have uh, this operator, no, actually it's the same as before. Okay, it's the same as before because it's the operator squared. Mm -hmm. So again, we will have, we have to use this, this expression. Yes. You, you can't read the indices, okay. R. R. Yeah, R. Should, should I change? Uh, <laughs> It's right, pi. Okay, <laughs> it's an R, I know. Anyway, R, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, ah, maybe you want this R, sorry. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. This is yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, we use the same. Um, same trick as before, so we have to compute the expectation value. Now we have to write x1 minus x1 plus r. So when you can see x1 minus x1 plus r, so this term now simplifies slightly. And now we have to consider this expression with the l equal 1 minus the same expression with l equal r. Notice that this is independent of l. Okay? So we can we can just write this minus this for L equal 1 minus this for L equal R times the rest. So this is equal to sum over K of, you have E to the minus 2 pi, 2 pi I K over capital N minus E to the minus 2 pi I K 1 plus R, ah, sorry, yeah, R over capital N, everything divided by square root of 2m omega sine of pi k over capital N times i a uh, capital N minus k minus a tan k. Hmm? This times itself, because it's squared, this times the same expression the value. 
right? Now, as before, when this operator acts on the left, is equal to zero, because this state is annihilated by a tag. It's on the left, not on the right. This is why there is a tag. So I can forget this and ignore this. And the same in this other expression, you will have something a n minus k, but instead of k, let's call k tilde, minus a dag k tilde here, or q, if I recall the q. And then you will have to ignore this part. So it because this annihilates the vacuum there. Okay. Yes? At the denominator? Uh, I missed it. Yes. Thanks. No, yes or no? Uh, I'm also here. Ah, uh -huh, right. Okay, thanks. Ah, no, there is an there is an here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, the final expression, what is it? But again, here you have a, yes. Yeah, 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 um, there is a sum over q. Yeah, it's, it's just the same expression. Uh, now, okay. You know what you've done, you have done before, and so you have here the vacuum again. Now you have sum, okay, let's write both. Sum over k, sum over q. And here you have e to the minus 2 pi i k over capital N minus e to the minus 2 pi i k i k is 1 plus uh, capital N divided by okay, i a n minus k. Mm -hmm. Then here we'll have the other with a q. So there will be e to minus 2 pi i q capital N minus e to the minus 2 pi i q 1 plus r divided by capital N divided by square root of 2 m omega sine of pi q over capital N n. And here you have the operator remain, which is minus i a dark q I wrote everything no now again we notice that the only way not to move this on the right and annihilate the vacuum is that n minus k should be equal to q or the opposite q equal n minus k if q is equal to capital n minus k this sign is exactly equal to this one because the sign is symmetric then all the rest is equal, so I can remove the square root here. This becomes n, ah, n minus k, mm -hmm. so I change the sign, k. This becomes n minus k, so I change the sign, k. Ah. Okay, this is n minus k, mm -hmm. and here there is no q anymore. Now again, a n minus k times a dag n minus k applied to the vacuum is equal to 1. You can simplify this to operator. And so we have our expression, which is sum over k from 1 to n minus 1 of this times this, okay, now, of e to the minus 2 pi i k over capital N minus e to the minus 2 pi i k over capital N 1 plus r, everything multiplied by its conjugate. So this is absolute squared divided by 2 m omega sine pi k over capital N. N. OK, now I'm below the line. This is our result. OK? How can you? OK, because this is useful. Mm. OK. Did you? 
You see, because this is the same expression with a plus sign instead of a minus sign. This is why I put it. Absolute squared is a conjugate expression. Now maybe you see immediately that this can be written as a sign. This term. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. What? The meaning. Ah, the meaning. meaning. Okay. So now we are computing x1, the position of one, the displacement of one ions, minus the displacement of the second of the other ions, which is actually the difference of the distance of the position hmm, squared. So you are saying that, uh, like you, you consider this, this displacement minus this displacement squared. If there is some correlation between the two, then this quantity should remain finite in particular. Because, okay, if, uh, if this is completely related to this one, if two, uh, if two ions are very far away, then this means that you can have one atom in one, uh, in one direction, some position, the other atoms in a completely different position, so it can be arbitrarily large. Instead, if there is some correlation, so if uh, this is on the right and also the other is on the right, then you can expect that this remains finite, this kind of quantity. This, this kind of quantity could remain finite. Finite, yeah. finite. yeah, this is the reason. So the, what we are looking for is whether in the limit of large r, so large, uh, large uh, these far away ions, hmm, then there is some correlation between their position or not. Hmm. So you, if you have some structure in, or maybe they are just random, then uh, okay. this is the essential the physical mean. In uh, I, I can tell you that in 3D, or maybe also in 2D, in this case, you have this kind of correlation. So you find something finite. There is some order. Okay. In 1D, we, we are going to see that this doesn't happen. OK, so the, this is the result. I, let's I just raise here. Also here. So this can be written as, so we have, this is equal to, as you see immediately, that is 1 over, uh, actually it's a 2, over m omega capital N, sum k from 1 to capital N minus 1, of sine squared of pi k r over capital N, over sine of pi k over capital N. This is just another way to rewrite this equation. Here you see you have phase, and yeah, I wrote everything in terms of a sine. You can do this, just a step. Then here, what we can do is we, we could consider the limit of large N in the sum. Maybe you are not familiar with the euler maclaurin formula. You are not. I guess so. The way to uh, to rewrite a sum in terms of integrals, I just tell you something that can be useful for your future. So here, I just uh, I could just give you the result, but maybe it could be useful for you. So if you have something like this, you have to compute some quantity like this, okay? And let's assume that this is actually a function of n over capital N, and this is a sufficiently smooth function, then what you find is that in the limit n goes to infinity, you can replace the sum uh, by an integral, and then you have that this is the integral over this variable of x from 0 to 1 of a of x. You can prove this. This is the yeah, this. This is called the, you can check if you are interested, the Euler Actually, okay, the formula is more complicated. I just, well, I show you a simple uh, application of the formula, where A is sufficiently small. So this means that in this case, actually, we can replace the sum, because you have 1 over n sum of this by an integral. Mm -hmm. 
And what we have is that this approaches in the limit n goes to infinity, 2 over m omega, the integral from 0 to pi of decay over pi of sine squared of r uh, y x okay k okay. divided by sine k hmm? and then you can prove okay this is not uh, uh, at least the coefficient is not trivial to find but I can I tell you the result that if you consider the limit r large so large distance between the two the, the, the ions r goes to infinity r is very large then you, you find that this behaves like 2 logarithm of r divided by pi m omega just so the result of a calculation if you want to just uh, uh, the coefficients are not really important so, uh, here we care maybe about the behavior that it behaves like a logarithm of the of the uh, the distance between the reference points of the, of the science. So in particular, what we find here is that this this quantity here, the this displacement approaches infinity logarithmically when the uh, these ions are very far away from each other. So this means that they are not really so correlated. So this is not another proof that this is not uh, solid. There is no order here in, in this system. Okay. There is, what happens is that they indeed, okay, I can tell you the, the classical result, if you study this model classically, then you find that in 1D there is no order. Hmm? Uh, order, I mean, uh, you, you, you don't have the, the positional order of the atoms. Hmm? And in 2D, in 3D there is positional order. In 2D you don't have positional order, but you have a orientational order, something very subtle in the classical case in 2D. In the quantum case, again in 1D, apparently we don't have any kind of order because of this uh, divergency here. I don't know the behavior in 2D, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, but I, I think that there is some order in that case. Okay, uh, we, we, we use this model just to, as an example of, uh, of a quantum multivariate system, so not uh, as an example of a phase transition, so we have what we find. Uh, anyway. Why? No, no, there is a potential. Okay, uh, you mean uh, you mean external potential? No, 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 no. Harmonic, possibly. Yeah, but the uh, you ah you mean if you change the the potential, you can find different. Uh, Ah, yeah, no, 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 we know that. Uh, we, this is for this model. I'm not saying that in general when the you know, this behavior. For the model we consider, we have uh, this not extremely interesting behavior. Maybe. Okay. Anyway, okay. This was just to present you the formalism of uh, uh, what, what is called the second quantization. So when you introduce this Fox space, when you have so the now your your states uh, don't have a fixed number of particles. Hmm? But you characterize the state using either bosons or fermions, and you have to consider all the possibilities. So, so you consider, for example, here you have n ions, but when you consider excitation, you can have infinitely many bosons. Because you have infinitely many excited states. So there is no constraints on the number of, of the particles. It's, it's clear. So it's not bounded by capital N. When you consider excited state, you can apply a DAG how many times you want, and you find always excited states. Like in the harmonic oscillator, you have infinitely many excited states. So you can apply a DAG how many times you want, uh, notwithstanding being only one oscillator. So, yeah. OK. Um, anyway, here we consider rather simple correlations, because we were able to compute them just the one, really. Rewriting this expression and simplify A and A DAG. But you can imagine that, uh, well, if we now compute slightly more complicated correlations, for example, this times, 
something like this. You put R1 here, x1 minus x1 plus R2 squared. This starts being a bit uh, complex now, because now you have two fermions from here, two, two sorry, fermions, two, two bosons from here, two linear combination bosons, and two linear combination bosons here. So four linear combination bosons. So you have to use this trick of moving all the fermions from one side to the other. Yeah, it can be a mess, it can be complicated, you know? And then you, maybe you could also be interested in other observers, so you say, oh, why don't put another one? And then you have six. So it can be, uh, well, uh, without doubt to you, we, we are able to solve this problem. But the, uh, the problem is that we are able to solve it in a decent time, no? Uh, <laughs> fortunately, there are some, uh, some techniques, some uh, well, some theorems, mathematical theorems that allow us to uh, to compute these more complicated expectation values just by reducing them to the ones that we compute, the ones when you have only two bosons. Okay. It's called the Dix theorem. If you, you already know the theorem in uh, high energy physics, hmm? but I I state now the result in this context so that you, in case you you need, you can apply. Okay. So the theorem is the following. So the uh, fixed theorem for both. Let's assume that you have operators of this form. Aj equals sum over n of Cjn An plus Djn A dag N. So linear combinations of your creation and, uh, and um, uh, destruction operators. Of particle, just a linear combination of them, an arbitrary linear combination. And just uh, I put this uh, label J just to indicate a particular linear combination which depends on some index. Okay. Now, we have seen, for example, I give you an example. If I want to compute AJ, AL, something like this, what do I find uh, on the ground state? So on the on the vacuum here. Hmm. What do I find? Well, I have just to write this expression. You have sum over n, and let's call the other one m of vacuum, or vacuum like fat, anyway. Uh, and here you have a c j n a n plus d j n a dot n, and with l that so c l m a m plus c d L M A dot M vacuum. Again, as before, we only need to okay. And this term is equal to zero. Doesn't doesn't count. This term doesn't count because yeah, I mean it's the vacuum. So this term gives you a delta M N. So again, this is equal to sum over n of, of c, c, j, n, d, l, d, uh, uh, d, l, n, minus, I oh, no, minus nothing, uh, just this, okay? Okay. This is just the result, or in the case of two, two operators, a, j, and l. But now, okay, we are, uh, more ambitious. I don't say, oh, uh, I would like to, to compute a, a generic okay. We want to compute a generic product of uh, A operators. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, very complicated. You have here, you can have A1, A2, and so on, until a n
in principle, this is a lot of uh, work no? that you have to do. But now, okay, the, the, there, there are some uh, some simple rules that you can immediately uh, see. First of all, let's assume that I have uh, an odd number of operators here. Hmm? Then this will become equal to zero. Why? Because the only way to, to avoid that one operator moves and goes to annihilate the, uh, the vacuum is that you, you must encounter another operator, uh, the, the DAG of itself, you must encounter. Okay? But if you have a number of operators, there will be always one, at least one operator that is unable to find this, uh, uh, this mate. I don't know. And so this means that this will be equal to zero. So the only way to make this differ from zero is that here we have a, an even number of operators. Otherwise, this is equal to zero. Yeah? You can see in the case a of one single operator, you have this term. So one is annihilated on the sorry, one is annihilated on the left and the other one on the right. So on the right and the other one on the left. And the same for three, five, and so on. So we can focus on this on this kind of correlations with an even number of operators. And the theorem, the Vick's theorem, states that this is equal to this is equal to the sum of the product k from 1 to n of the vacuum here, a i k, a j k, phi. What is the sum? Sum over o partitions one uh, one two n of i one j one i n j n with the with the I with I n smaller than j, j n. Now this is the theorem, and then uh, now I explain you what does it mean. Uh, let's, let's see what you what you do. So in practice, what you? Okay, I can. I think I can. Oh, I can use this part. So what do you do in practice? So let's uh, let's apply it in uh, some simple cases. So you you understand what's the what's the idea? So let's assume that we have four. Four operators. Special value of a1, a2, a3, a4. Now the idea is that this is equal to the special value of a1, a2. You can see all the, the pair that you can form here, all their pairs. So you start with a1, a2, and it remains a3, a4. Plus, then you have the other possibility, a1, a3. You have a1. A3 and remains A2, A4. Plus, the last one is A1, A4. And here you have A2, A3. What happens if you have six operators? Six operators, then you have again A1, A2, and then you have here you have to consider the rest which is a3, a4, a5, a6. So you can do it recursively, if you want. Plus a1, a3, and the rest, a2, a4, a5, a6. Plus a1, 
a4, a2, a3, a5, a6, plus a1, a5, a2, a3, a4, a6, the last one, plus a1, a6, a2, a3, a4, a5. And for each one of these, you use the same decomposition of before. So there are many terms, fine. And, uh, but you see what well, is nice that they, we are able to reduce this very com this is extremely complex. Because here, each term is a sum, is a linear combination of uh, creation destruction operators, and there are six of them. So I say a really a lot of work. And we are able to reduce everything in terms of the expectation values of just two operators. Which we know, which we already computed. Hmm? Uh, okay, what is. I. Maybe I could. Tell you. Um, how is this called? As a matter of fact, there is a name for the entire combination. Uh, if you want. Okay, this is. Mean. No, what I mean, uh, a name for. A mathematical name for this kind of uh, combination. Uh, it's called the permanent. No, it's the permanent of a particular matrix. So uh, it's a strange, okay, it's the equivalent of determinant. But, uh, so you need, you, maybe you can recognize that this is similar to determinant. If you interpret this as the element of the matrix. It's very similar to determinant, but now we have all plus signs. Hmm? And this is called permanent. <laughs> Just to know if uh, someone asks you what is a permanent something related to the Higgs theorem in bosons. Oh. Permanent? Yeah. Permanent. OK, this is all fundamental. Uh, just a curiosity if you is the, uh, is the deter is a determinant with a, actually, it's not. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. More, more or less, so let's say it's not exactly the permanent. It's uh, the truth is that the, the, the square of this is a permanent of the matrix. OK, uh, this is just uh, well, mm, it's not important. Uh, forget it. OK, that's not. Yes, it's like, OK, but the, this is not like a determinant. As a matter of fact, it's like a Fafian. We will we'll see. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, uh, Okay. Just forget, forget this uh, uh, this permanent <laughs> thing. It's not, it's not really important. Okay. So anyway, but there is a way in a recursive way to you just consider all the perm possible for possible permutation. You you have a way to to access also this kind of um, correlations. Uh, I, I have to say that in this bosonic case, yeah, indeed, you don't know permanent, no. But there is a reason why you don't know permanent. Because, because there are no many theorems on permanence. So, <laughs> so, so this means that you, uh, it's nice that we have this expression, but we are not able actually to do mm, many calculations, I would say. Uh, if, I, if I give you, if I ask you, oh, what is now let's consider a product of uh, 2n, 2n operator for generic n, I doubt that you, you are able to give me some expression, OK? Some interesting uh, Fortunately, uh, this, uh, uh, if you consider the fermionic analog of this model, then the situation changes. Okay? Because in that case, we can actually compute also more complicated correlation functions. Because instead of permanence, we have determinants. And there are many theorems for determinants. OK, well, just a parenthesis. OK, uh, so in these two lectures, we consider this uh, three uh, now. OK, this uh, um, harmonic chain, so a quantum mechanical problem. We start from that. And then we, we use a different formalism to, to a different respect to usual formalism to solve the problem, introducing these ladder operators. And uh, uh, so we, uh, we define um, this kind of Fox space, which is constructed using uh, some, uh, uh, some effective particles, bosons. Uh, with which you can indeed uh, uh, you can uh, you can construct the ground state and the excited states of the of the model. We in this particular model we found that this operator commute with one another, uh, except for the 
commutation between A and A dag, the same operator. So they are bosons. Okay. okay. Now, uh, maybe in the future, not now, not next time, maybe, but uh, or maybe also tomorrow, I don't know, uh, we will also see some dynamics in this problem, perhaps. But uh, I think that now it's better if we, if I also uh, present another model, uh, another simple model, uh, so all the static properties of this other model, and see how to solve it, and see some general, general properties of this other model. And this is a spin chain model. So instead of considering our harmonic oscillator, we we consider again as in the last, in the in the, in the first lecture, a, uh, a spin system, system of spins. And so we start discussing the quantum easing model for icing, if you prefer. I don't know. I, I think it's easing is better, but I don't know. So, see the quantum. Amazing model. No, oh. uh, model. Uh, one, one dimensional, one dimensional quantum. Is in model. Uh, also, also known as transverse transverse. Field is easy to check. Okay, easy, okay. Also known as the transverse field is okay. okay. I think that uh, most of you know the, the classical is in model. I want to see everybody. Yeah. So, uh, so the classical is in mode. For example, it is something like sub over i of s i s i plus one. Then you put uh, this is a bit uh, no. g. You want to put it? Yes. Why not? Hmm? You mean this? We put also j. This is the classical. Classical is in model, well, so you have this term, then you can have a magnetic field, okay? And uh, well, we know how to solve this problem. Okay, maybe the, the, here instead of i, if you consider generic dimension, generally there is a sum over nearest neighbor spins. You can have in 1D, 2D, or whatever, and then you have this magnetic field. We we know the solution of this model in uh, one dimension. It's easy, no? You know, um, no? I guess. And uh, you can solve it using the transfer matrix formalism. It's a very simple calculation. Then we also know the solution of this model in 2D, more tricky solution in the classical case. I'm saying we don't know the solution of this model in 3D. Uh, if you if you find a way to solve the model, well, if you want to tell me, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what about the quantum the quantum version? Generally, when uh, we, we discuss uh, yeah, uh, a, a, uh, when we compare classical models with the quantum models, what happens in d plus one in the classical case happens in d, in dimension d in the quantum case. So for this model, we are able to solve easily. We will solve the case, uh, uh, the the one-dimensional case. It will be is feasible we are not able to solve the two-dimensional quantum easing model, as far as I know, okay? So, because we are this these lectures, quantum lectures, so we have to confine ourselves in one d one dimensional quantum easing model. So the model, I will consider the ferromagnetic model, what is the name of why I'm saying ferromagnetic? Yeah, anyway, because I put minus sign here. So J from one to capital N. Of now instead of having the spins, the classical spins, which are just variables that can assume values 
plus one or minus one or zero one. Okay. Now we have uh, spins, spins that we can represent. We have seen the first uh, the first lecture by Pauli matrices. Okay. So the generally the Hamiltonian is written in this form. So you have a Hamiltonian. There is some interaction between near neighbor spins in a given direction. For example, x. Let's call this x direction. Then we can put an external field. But in order to make this problem quantum, we 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 shouldn't put a, a longitudinal field in the same direction because otherwise it becomes just a classical Ising model. Because then you have uh, this, you can treat all these degrees of freedom like classical spin because everything commutes here. If I put here sigma j x, uh, this commutes with this, so we can solve this problem in the basis that diagonalizes sigma sigma x. So this is actually a classical easy model in this case. So in order to see some quantum effect, we have to 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 tilt the uh, the magnetic field. So instead of uh, having the magnetic field in the x direction, we consider the magnetic field, for example, in the z direction. So this becomes a quantum problem. This term doesn't commute with this one, so it's a non-trivial problem. Your choice. Okay. I prefer to put it here, uh, so I just take. I can choose J as a dimension of energy, and then this will become a dimension without dimension. Dimensionless. Sorry. Okay. So just a simple choice to avoid because I don't want to have to write H with some dimension. So we. Uh, this is the model. What? The, so what do we know about this model? So without solving it, can we? Can you already? understand something of this model. For example, what happens if uh, if h is very large? So you imagine that there is, okay, you have this, these are spins, hmm? they interact between one another, and then there is some magnetic field in a given direction, you know, z, okay? And now this magnetic field is so strong, it's very, very strong. So what happens to the spins? Yeah. H is very large. It's very, very big. It's very large. What happens? All the spins tend to align along the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field. Okay? So this is why it's ferromagnetic. Okay, it's ferromagnetic in that case. So what happens is that you, you, you increase H, all the spins tend to align in the Z direction. And so what is the ground state of this model? The limit H goes to infinity. It's simply all the spin. Oh, let's assume that h is larger than uh, 0, okay? Right, so it goes to larger or equal. And we consider the limit h goes to infinity. So we know that the ground state of the model in the limit h goes to infinity is nothing but all the spins in the z direction. Yes? Yeah, the sigma is just uh, two. No, it's a two by two matrix, so it can be either up or down. It's a spin one half. It's the standard version of this model, like the the classical Ising model, you have two two possibilities. Otherwise, you you call it a what's smaller. So this is the the ground state in the limit h goes to infinity. So we already know something. Uh, what about h goes to zero? If h is equal to zero, what what do we know? We don't have this term. We have already some time. So, what's the ground state? Everything. One half and one half. Uh, uh, oh, what do you want? Okay, one half. What? I mean, the disorder. So, the Why is the disorder? Uh, how would you infer that this is a disorder? That the ground state is disorder. There is no interaction. Uh, there is only this term. Okay? And you want to minimize this term. Because there is a minus sign, you want to maximize this. And uh, the maximum of this actually is simpler than that. See? 
maximum is just all spins are aligned in the x direction or in the opposite. Because here you, you can see the, the, the uh, you, you can see the sign of the, of the direction. Yeah? So you have two possibilities. You have either, okay, let's use this notation for, for saying that the spin align in the x direction, I put an x here, and this is z. Yeah. You can have this or this. Oh, my components is two. It's a spin one alpha. Each spin. So it's a spin one alpha. Okay, in the yeah, in the we are in the sigma z eight. So, so this is a spin in the z direction. So it's here. Yeah, we have two possibilities. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, so well, what happens when we have this kind of degeneracy now? What can happen? Spontaneous symmetry breaking, and uh, so what does it mean? You know, what's the mechanism? How does it happen? So, 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 so the idea is that we wrote the Hamiltonian in this form, no? But now, well, maybe there are extremely small terms, just the epsilon, some really really small, that approaches zero, uh, that, for example, could be coupled with a magnetic field in the x direction. Why not? Right? You, you cannot exclude this kind of term, so in the Hamiltonian. Maybe we are considering the limit in which epsilon is very, very small. We are unable to see it. Just a fluctuation. You say, okay, we, we, here there are other terms you are not considering, are very, very small in the Hamiltonian. And, uh, uh, and the idea is that, okay, but we would like to, to use this Hamiltonian to approximate this problem, we don't want to take into account all these terms. Nevertheless, they are important when you have this kind of degeneracy. Because there is a symmetry in this, in this Hamiltonian, and which is the symmetry that you want to break. Because you, you introduce a symmetry breaking, so which is the symmetry of this Hamiltonian? Reflection? Uh, with respect to what? Uh, you mean, uh, okay, so you mean that uh, you can rotate the spins, hmm? and uh, so in particular, yeah, uh, that's true, uh, around the z-axis, for example, you rotate the spin, and, uh, and it because this term goes in itself, and because it's a rotation about z, then this remains in itself. So it's a rotation of pi, or, uh, pi, pi rotation. So the operator that uh, generates this, uh, this symmetry is the product, over L of sigma Z. So if you apply this operator to left or to the right of this Hamiltonian, this is invariant. But if you apply this operator here, it maps this state into this other state. Okay. So what we have is that the Hamiltonian is symmetric. And now we have a, a, a degenerate ground state. And, uh, and then the problem becomes, OK, which ground state should I, should I consider? Should I consider just the superposition, an incoherent superposition of the two ground state, or maybe one is better than one, than another, another state? And what happens is that if you consider this fluctuation that I told you before, what happens is that uh, there are two privileged ground states. Yeah. So the ground state, the ground state is not just a linear combi generic linear combination of these two. It is not. It's one of the two. Okay? The symmetry is broken, and you have either the spins are aligned in the x direction or in the opposite. Okay. Now, uh, I want to. Okay, this may be. Might be yeah. Why can be? Okay, because uh, there is some reason that it's not stable under these fluctuations. But there is also another physical reason. Because, OK, uh, let's assume that the state is in the superposition of the two. So we have the state with the sum coefficient alpha, this other state, dividing to the root of 1 plus alpha squared, for example. Yeah. Let's assume we have this our 
your, your ground state because you want to consider a superposition. And now let's compute uh, correlations. Okay? For example, we could compute the correlation. Uh, which correlation? We compute the cor let's call this psi. Hmm? And we could compute psi sigma 1z sigma 1 plus rz psi. Okay? So this is the correlation between two spins at distance r. Hmm? And then I remove from this term the value of the spin at position 1, psi, position r. Why am I doing this? Sorry? Yeah, you know, but because the question was why I cannot be in oh, the state. Sorry. And I'm trying to give you some physical reason why you shouldn't expect it. So let's assume that we are in a state like this. And now let's compute this kind of correlations. And let's see the meaning of what we find. Because we compute this correlation, so the state is, is trivial, no? So it's easy to compute this, this correlation. And in particular, what we find is, OK, uh, this stands for this, huh? yeah? all spins in the x or the opposite direction. So here you have, uh, let's write everything, write everything. Yes, let's write everything. So we have uh, this state plus alpha star this value is for root 1 plus alpha squared. No, this is yeah, okay. this. Then you have here sigma 1z, sigma 1 plus rz. And here you have this plus alpha this divided by square root 1 plus alpha squared. This is the first. And then you have the other two, and we compute them. So now, when you consider this term, for example, then you have the operator. And then you consider the other, the other term in the opposite direction. Now, here means that all the spins are in the given direction, and this one, all the spins are in the other direction. Sigma z is able to reverse, to flip one spin, but only one. So this sigma z is flipping the first spin. This sigma z is flipping the 1 plus r spin. But then there are all the other spins which are in the opposite, in the opposite direction. So the scalar product between two is equal to 0. So this means that when you consider this term, the, scar, the, the contribution from this and this is equal to 0. The same from this and this. So the only terms that contribute are this with this and this with this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there is an X. So, OK. OK, no, I need a, now I need uh, yeah. It's X which uh, flips the spins. OK. <laughs> yeah. Yes, OK. As a matter of fact, this doesn't go. Oh, just, uh, I have to, okay, I have to correct myself, because I, uh, I wrote the opposite. So let's consider this term and this term again. OK, now we have sigma X. This is an eigenstate of sigma x, sorry. It's an eigenstate, but you see that the, these are two different eigenstates. So when you consider the, 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 the overlap between the two is equal to 0. So it's an eigenstate of sigma. The same for this, but now you have to consider the other contribution. The other contribution, what is this? In this case, you have the spin, which is 1 in given direction. So you have 1 times 1. So you have. This is equal to 1 over square root of 1 plus alpha squared. OK, alpha is there to divide. Mm -hmm. Square. And then you have the other contribution from this other term, which is the same as this, but there is a 1 plus alpha squared, I would say. There is a yes, I would say so. Why minus? Because there are two, no? Two of them, so you have minus one times minus one, and should be equal to one. I think this is correct, I guess, uh, if I uh, did I do something wrong. Uh, ah, because the other is, uh, OK. Is equal to one. Fine, OK, it's a number. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, let's compute this. What is this? Now we have the same as before. All right, let's call root 1 plus half squared. Sigma 1x times the same. Okay. 
Again, the same. This gives a contribution one. Now this gives you a contribution uh, minus minus one. Okay, so you have here one minus alpha squared divided by one plus alpha squared. Is it right or am I wrong? Uh, I guess it can be correct. Maybe no, yeah, I think so. I think it's correct. No? Okay. Now you have to multiply this. You must contribute the square of this because you have two of these terms. So in the end, you find that this, this two, are equal to one minus alpha square divided by one plus alpha square squared. And this other term is the it was equal to one. So now you have the, this term minus this term. Well, it depends, uh, depends on alpha. And this is something different from zero for any distance. Now, what is this correlation? We are considering so the correlation between one spin in a given position, the other spin even far away from it. And we are saying that uh, even if the, in the limit r goes to infinity, this doesn't decouple. So in other words, it's like that there is no locality in this theory. Because you have that uh, what's, what's happening here depends on what's happening on the moon. Now, so this is why this is not a physical, a physical state. This kind of state break cluster decomposition. So you cannot, uh, you, you, you cannot just describe your state looking on the local properties because everything depends on what's happening very far away from here. Yeah. This is the reason why you don't, I think a physical reason why these are not physical states. So, yeah. So, in that sense, the ground state is This doesn't matter, because, okay, in this simple case, you have a, that is not an entangled state, but you have a situation where you have, you can have entangled. Okay. For example, if H is more, you have entangled. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's enough about the ground state and the limits. But okay, but you see that uh, so we are describing two very different situations. For h goes to infinity, we said that the spin just align in a given direction. Instead, now for h equals to zero, we see that, that there is some symmetry which is broken, and so we, we don't have just a paramagnetic phase, but we, we have a ferromagnetic phase because the spins are broken not in the direction of the magnetic field, are broken in the direction of a, an arbitrary small infinitesimal magnetic field in the x direction. So this is why it's ferromagnetic. So it's a, it's, a, it's a magnetism that remains even if you remove the magnetic field. So the system is ferromagnetic in the limit h goes to zero. So this paramagnetic h goes to infinity. Now, because we are describing different phases, we should expect the existence of some phase transition in the middle. Okay. Now, uh, what is different with respect to what you know? That, uh, classically, Generally, you, you have a similar situation, but the, the parameter that you vary is the temperature. So you, you generally you pass from a, a disorder phase at high temperature, then you decrease the temperature, and then you, you end up in an order phase, like in a two-dimensional AC model. Here, you don't have temperature. We are at zero temperature, because we are describing the ground state of the model. The parameter becomes, in this case, a, just an Hamiltonian parameter, the magnetic field, for example. So you change some parameter, and you can completely change the properties of the of the ground state, and also of the excitations. Okay? The, 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 this is essentially the, the the correspondence between uh, classical phase transition and quantum phase transition. Okay. Um, uh, so is it worth to? Uh, Okay, uh, I give you five minutes. Uh, but I, I require, I request some explanation of your answer. Okay, so you choose, you, you take the, uh, what you think is correct, then you explain why. And uh, in my idea, if you don't explain why I have the score of that question, so you should do it. <laughs> okay.
And then uh, maybe there, there could be also open questions, so with an open answer. So, uh, most of them will be just the multiple choice question. You sh should be able to, to answer this question using your, you can use your notes, no problem with that. You can use books, uh, papers, uh, uh, no electronic devices because otherwise you start chatting, so I don't know. Only for that, otherwise I would allow you that. So if you want to cheat, uh, try you not know, to show it. So. I, I don't, okay, so, so no, be, be smart, okay, well, but I, I, I'm telling you this because, okay, we, we are researchers, no? uh, as a researcher, we, we use all, uh, all material that we can find, so in your case, the material is the notes, the books, and your neighbor, because it's not, so if you're able to use uh, uh, their intuition, it's okay, it's fine. <laughs> No, the phone, no, because you, I know that you start chatting. No, no, then no. Hey, yeah, I, I can I check. <laughs> no, 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 no. Only for that, but then. How do The structure? What, do you want exam now? <laughs> no. Okay, the question, okay, uh, there would be. Um, Several questions. Okay, I, I I will ask something which is related to I guess uh, maybe all the lectures somehow in a way or in the other. Starting from the first lecture, there will be some questions that uh, you can answer if you follow the also the first lecture. Maybe. And if you simple, very simple questions sometimes. So you will be surprised of how simple can be the question. But sometimes okay, well, it's, we we don't need to answer. No complicated question to see whether you understand or not. <laughs> so, and but okay, in the end there will be also some problem, maybe that is uh, less simple. Okay, just because otherwise you get bored. So uh, I give you also some nice problem to solve. This is the idea. Yeah. You have some simple list of exercises. Yeah, uh, you want the exam as well. So <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, it's just. Uh, you just read the, your notes, and uh, you, you should be able, I think, to you should be able to uh, to answer the quest. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, uh, without solving this problem, we already understand something you know, about this problem. So we, we are saying that uh, we are considering H, the model for H that goes from zero to infinity. And we, without anything, we already know that the temperature equals to zero. Here, the model is paramagnetic. Paramagnetic, para, 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 okay, para. And here we have a ferromagnetic model at zero. And our intuition, physical intuition, uh, just uh, uh, thinking of a classical AC model is that uh, there should be some transition, some, some phase transition at some point, which uh, well, I will call one. Okay. Just <laughs> okay. And, uh, um, but now, okay, well, Fortunately, we can solve this model. So we can, uh, we have access of, uh, uh, access to the ground state of the model for any value of h. So we are not restricted to h equals zero h equal to infinity, which are kind of trivial limits. But we can, we can compute the entire spectrum, uh, excitation energy, correlation functions, uh, dynamics in this model. It's an amazing model. Because How can you tune? Why do you want to tune now? We are doing static. So you just fix the magnetic field, and then we. Then uh, it's not dynamics. And it's not. No. It's H. Okay. <laughs> what? No. What was it? I saw the H ball. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would be even more interesting if you face transition here. No. Between classical, classical physics and quantum physics. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, how do we solve this model? Now we, we already solved the, uh, the the harmonic chain, and the idea was to introduce this uh, kind of uh, ladder operator, creation operator. Yeah, we would like to do something similar. And uh, the reason is that uh, when you can't do something similar, you have to use a very complicated formalism, and if it works, so we prefer to that uh, it's possible to solve the problem in, in that way. Okay. And uh, this is uh, a model that can be solved in a very similar model uh, to the to the quantum harmonic chain. What's the idea? Okay, in the quantum harmonic uh, uh, chain, we mapped. The, the degrees of freedom x and p uh, in two bosons. So we would like to do something similar here. So we would like to find a mapping in two fermions, star, as we'll see in a moment. How do we do this? So uh, here is the following. So we, let's now consider a generic uh, spin one half state. Spin one half means you can have uh, well spins in any direction, okay? And in particular, let's consider a particular state which is all spin down. Okay. All spin down, and then uh, maybe we, we already have an intuition that uh, we could interpret this state with all spin, spin down as a vacuum. Then we could say, well, we, we, every time that we flip a spin, it's like to put, to include a particle in the, in the, uh, in the state, just this is just a rough uh, idea. No, so let's assume that we do something like this. Okay, let's guess. Let's try. Let's start guessing. So we say, okay, let's interpret this state of all spins down as the vacuum of some uh, particles, and then okay, the uh, so using this kind of uh, rough idea, we will say and uh, remembering the. Uh, the harmonic oscillator would say, well, I would like to define the particle, the one has, that flips the spin. How do you flip spins? Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, you are You're right. Yes, but sigma x or Sigma y. No. Now, <laughs> if you apply sigma x, no, then uh, you you end up with something which is seem to be Hermitian. So we want something. Uh, so you want to uh, create. You want to consider an operator that creates a particle, and you want the the conjugate will destroy the particle. So this is, uh, yeah, Isimax does the job here in the state, but, all, but apparently there is something not perfect. We could do the same trick with sigma y, no? Sigma y also, no? So for example, yeah, uh, we, could, uh, we could do this, for example, let's see what happens if you apply this operator. So sigma x plus sigma y is equal to this state, it's represented in this way. When you apply it to spin down, what happens? We find spin up. So it does what we want. Now let's assume that we consider the conjugate of this now, because we want to destroy, we want to uh, flip the spin again. Uh, so, so we consider this, which is now 0, 0, 1, 0. And now let's apply it to spin up to see what happens. To spin up it is equal to down, and it's okay. And we also see that when you apply this to spin down, which is our vacuum, we find zero. So actually, this has nice properties, uh, very similar to the properties of the uh, ladder operator in the, uh, in the bosonic case. So this operator, so rise the spin when it is down. Then instead, if you consider the conjugate, it, it flip again the spin from up to down, and it also destroys the state when the spin is down. So it's, uh, it's nice. Okay. Still, now we'll see that there are there is some problems here. Why? Because okay, we we would like to so define our ladder operator 
for example, in this way, no? let's call this D, for example. Mm -hmm. And then well, uh, this index is just the position no? in, the, in the chain. Then we could consider two of these operators, which are two different particles in our P, the picture of before. So we could have, for example, D dag L and D dag N. Okay, another part. And x plus i sigma n y over 2. So what, up, what happens if you consider the commutator between these two? These are defined in different, different sites. They don't commute. Yeah, sorry, they, they commute. So, like uh, in the bosonic case. So, Andrew, you, you can be happy now, no? because oh, we are finding the same as before. So, we find commutation, different uh, values of the indices. We find that they seems to, uh, to do the right job for the, for the vacuum. But now, okay, let's check the commutation relation, okay, of this, the commutation relation of this form, dl, d dag l. If you consider the computer, what happens? So what we find is that if you apply dl and d dag l, what you find that this is equal to one minus d dag l dl. You can check this. You see that this is kind of strange because now if you consider the commutator of these two, dl d dag l, now you find one minus twice d dag l dl. So before we had just one, and now we have also this term. This term which is uh, which counts the number of a fermi of no, particles uh, at position l. So it's something more complicated than uh, what we what we found. Uh, now what am I right? So sorry, what am I right? Uh, I don't know. It's right. Yes, I'm right. Right. So we find something a commutation relation which is kind of strange, no? But now you realize that uh, if instead of considering the commutator between the two the two operator, you consider the anti commutator. What happens? You find that it's equal to one. Anti commutator should make you think that uh, maybe. Uh, instead of uh, uh, trying to, to map the problem to bosons, we should try to map it into fermions. The problem here is that we found a mixed algebra. Because when we consider now the same site, we have that the anti commutator, indeed, between D L and D dag L is equal to 1, as you would expect for fermions. But now, when you consider different L, then we find that the commutator is equal to 0. So these are uh, strange particles, and they are called uh, uh, hardcore bosons, not because they like this kind of music, but because they are, uh, so they are bosons that behave like fermions when they, when they are close together. So they, they would like to be bosons, so they, uh, they commute different sides, but then when they are in the same side, they are hard like, like fermions. But we don't know the, uh, at least, I, 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 I don't know how to, how to, um, I don't have much knowledge of this hardcore boson, so uh, I don't want to use this kind of strange particles. Okay? I'm a racist. <laughs> so let's, let's try to map this problem to some, uh, uh, some familiar particles. So either bosons or fermions, something with a, with a very precise algebra. And we can do it. And we can do it, and, uh, and in this case, you, you, you can, uh, you can do it into fermions. Why we should expect fermions and not bosons? In the case of bosons, as we have uh, seen uh, before, we have uh, infinitely many excited states. Because you can always uh, uh, create a new boson in the state. Indeed, in the harmonic oscillator, you have uh, infinitely many states. Here, we are considered a chain, a spin chain. So the number of excited states is finite. Is the maximum number is 2 to the n. So you cannot put an arbitrary number of particles in this theory. So this is why you should be think, oh, maybe bosons are not the right particles to consider. We should consider both fermions, because we know that there is the exclusion, the power exclusion principle. And so you cannot put uh, more spins in the same state. Mm -hmm. And so you have a finite number of, uh, of states. So they could, in principle, describe our, 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 our basis, at least. Okay? 
in space. Uh, how can we fix this, uh, this algebra, this problem of algebra? Actually, it's, uh, it's kind of simple. So, and, uh, and it was discovered by Jordan and Wigner. Probably first with Jordan or Jordan, I don't know. Jordan, I don't know. So, and the idea is to consider this operator C dag L, which is equal to the product for j smaller than L, uh, smaller than L, so j from 1 to L minus 1 of sigma j z, everything times sigma, sigma j x plus i sigma, sorry, L, x plus i sigma L y divided by 2. So, like the like before, but now we have this type of string of sigma z. The string of sigma z in this state doesn't do anything because it just it, it's a number. It just counts the number of spin down. Okay, so we are just okay. We we, we are modifying slightly this operator in such a way that here it doesn't do anything apart from a number, but it changes the algebra of this operator. Why the algebra is different now? Okay, I wrote all, I write also CL, so it's the same string here. Sigma J Z, sigma L X minus I, sigma L Y. Mm -hmm. Now let us consider L different from N. Oh, sorry, wait a second. Okay. Okay, because before we, we had just this, okay? And uh, this operator has uh, the problem that they commute when there are different sides. But the, when you consider the, the operator with the DAG at the same side, then it, uh, it, it, it has the, the anti-commutation relation, which is not so, so it's not a boson. It's not a, like a Fermi. But then, then we observe, oh, but here if I consider the dimension of the inverse space, I realize that uh, instead of having an infinite, an infinite number of uh, states as in the harmonic oscillator, here the number of states is finite. And so this means maybe I shouldn't look uh, for bosons, but it's actually more, it's cleverer to look for fermions in this case. So this is why I would like to change the algebra, uh, preserving the, the anti-commutation relation at the same side. Yeah? And this is a way to fix the commutation at different sides. Indeed, if we consider now the commutator between, no, the commutator, if you consider C dag L and C N, for example, for L different from N, what you can check is that if you consider the anticommutator, I don't know if you, I hope you know, so the anticommutator AB is defined as AB plus BA, so it's like AB, AB, BA, so it's like the commutator with a plus sign, and so you find that this is equal to delta LN, and then you find that C dag L, C dag N is equal to del, no, is equal to zero. You can check it. And probably you will do after this lecture, uh, the tutorial. Okay. So, uh, why this is nice? Because now we can actually use the same interpretation as before. The only difference is that now Instead of having bosons, we have fermions. So if we call this the ground state, okay, it's not this, this is not the ground state, just a, a state, a vacuum of the fermions that we define. Then given this, uh, this vacuum, we can generate all the bases of all the spin using this, this kind of uh, uh, creation operators. So in other words, each state corresponds to a given uh, state in the Fox space of these fermions. You can reinterpret it as a, as, a, as, a, as a state in the Fox space. Hmm? For example, you have this is the ground state. Now let's consider, for example, the state with the spin L, just one spin, position L. What does it mean here? I have to count, I have to multiply the string of sigma z up to L minus 1. So here I find minus 1 to the L minus 1 because I have spin down. And then I have to flip the spin there. So I have here down up to L minus 1, then I have an up, and then all the other are down. This corresponds to, to have a fermion hmm, at position L. 
Uh, okay, this is not an ordinary fermion, as a matter of fact, because maybe you learned that you know that fermions generally have a, uh, have a half integer spin. So, in particular, fermions can have the, the, the simplest fermions are, have the spin one half. So, you can find them in two states. So, given a, these are spinless fermions. Because you, in, uh, in this notation, you have that you can have just one fermion per, per state. So, in L, you cannot have two fermions. How can you see this? If you apply two creation operators at the same side, you find that it's equal to zero. Why? Because this, the square of this, is equal to zero. So it means that you can't have two fermions in the same state. Hmm? Yeah. So this is a simple solution. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. It, uh, you see, uh, we, we are talking about position, but you realize that uh, yes, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not rigorous, because here there is an operator which is a non-local operator. So we, we say position, but we, we should be always careful. So we are changing the space, so now it's just a, uh, just a simple way to, to present it. But then what you realize is that uh, when you generate this, this, this these states always you have this kind of phase, non trivial phases, phase, okay, because of the non locality of the transformation. But okay, this is not relevant. Uh, just that uh, we, we are just trying to, to reinterpret all the uh, basis of our space in terms of uh, some Fox space of uh, fermions that we define. So called, I wrote this now, Jordan, Bidna, fermions. This one, uh, the general function. <laughs> you see, this is completely general, independent of the model. So we, I, I introduced the model, but now this is really general. And saying if for any given spin chain model with spin one half, we can define this operator. And they satisfy the, the correct uh, algebra. They can be interpreted as fermions, and uh, the vacuum of this fermion is just the state. It will spin down. It's completely general. OK, yes. There was a question. Oh, okay. uh, because you, I applied this operator to the vacuum. Now you have this string of sigma z, and you have that here. You have all uh, the spins points in the down direction. So you have minus one to the uh, one minus one per spin up to l minus one. So minus one to the l minus one. Okay. Uh, so now maybe you understand the idea. The idea is to map the summit to the right, the Hamiltonian, in terms of these operators. OK, just that. And see what, what happens. So let's. Sorry, the transformation here. Okay, do you know this notation? Sigma L plus. The sigma L plus is equivalent to say sigma x plus i sigma y over two, which is this matrix. Analogously, one defines sigma minus as sigma x minus i sigma y over two, which is this matrix. It's represented by this matrix. I know that it's not good to change notation many times, but sometimes it's usable. And it's it's better, better no? Because then I remember that every time that it's a diagonal is a plus ten. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, I know it's not good to change notation, but uh, I, I would like to define now. No. Well, the index. 
No, it should be upper. It should be upper. No, sigma plus. No, it's defined this way. It's going to have, uh, in the literature, you always you find sigma plus with a plus. Uh, why? No, okay, this is not a no, 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 I don't want. No, no, no. It's, it's not important. Come on, uh, uh, because you the sigma is uh, sigma plus is not defined in other way. So you have sigma x, y, z, sigma plus, and sigma minus. So it's, this is declaration. <laughs> okay, but uh, but I want to introduce other. And the operator, just because it's convenient, uh, not because I want to bore you with other notation, but let's introduce this operator, which you call A, like before, I'm sorry for that, uh, like uh, in, the, in, the, in the harmonic chain. And we define this operator in this way. A, 2L minus 1, which is equal to C dag L plus CL, and A, 2L, which is I, CL minus C dag L. Now, maybe you recognize something very similar to what we found in the harmonic oscillator. When we do this kind of combina combination, in the harmonic oscillator, we, we had something like x and p. It was the inverse relations. Okay. Now, okay, uh, what happens when we consider this kind of, uh, of transformation? So, what algebra satisfies this A? You can check that now if you consider the anticommutator of A, L and A N, this is twice delta L N. So, again, they anti commute, like fermions. Mm -hmm. There is only a difference, they are emission. Okay? Maybe you, uh, uh, sometimes you heard about that, uh, this, about Majorana fermions. These are Majorana fermions. So they are their own emission. They, they are their own antiparticles. So the the the, the adjoint of the of the fermions itself, and they satisfy the, the same algebra of the fermions. Okay, these are what. Well, it's not important. It's just a question of terminology. So these are called Majorana fermions. Okay, they, they are useful because it's easy. Uh, they, they allow to, to rewrite the Hamiltonian and also the correlation functions in an easier way. Just for that. Hmm? Okay. So let, let's use this operator then. And uh, let's write, for example, in terms of the spins, what are these operators? Well, you can easily see that the A to L minus 1 is nothing but the string. Of sigma of sigma z l minus one sigma j j z times sigma l x now and then you have a to l which is product j from one to l minus one sigma j z times sigma l y so we don't have plus and minus and you have here okay just the definition and they satisfy this algebra. Okay, then I think now it's time to, to, to apply this transformation to the Hamilton and see what we find. Ah, by the way, what is the inverse transformation of this? Okay, if you multiply this operator or this other operator is the same, by the same string of sigma z, then it simplifies the string because sigma z squared is equal to one. So what you find is that sigma lx is equal to the, the string there. Times a to l minus one. Okay, but now here I have, I, I did just half of the job because now uh, I should express a sigma z in terms of the major and fermions, let's say. And what is sigma z? Sigma z is written like i sigma y times sigma x. Sigma z i sigma y sigma x. You can check this. So this means that if I multiply by i, multiply this by this, I actually find sigma z. So I have a sigma lz is equal to i a 
12 a 12 minus 1 and so I can put he, this here and then if you want I have an expression for sigma z in terms of the mirror reference which is something like uh, something like minus 1 to t l minus 1 y minus 1 uh, what is it? No, it's not minus one. It's something like minus i to the l minus one, and then I have product from j from one to two l minus two of a j times a to l minus one. Okay, as a matter of fact, this is not really important. Anyway, well, anyway okay. This is even uh, it's easier to work with this expression generally, just because I don't we don't want to to work with spaces, uh, so with this hybrid notation. Anyway, so we have, this is sigma x, and sigma y is equal to the, again, the string, times now a to l, okay? So we plug now this expression to the, the Hamiltonian of the Ising model, and see what happens. I, I just write the, the result. You can do the, the substitution. You have to play a bit with the with the algebra of the Pauli matrices when you move them, but it's a, it's five minutes, so it's, you can do that. And what you find is this: h is equal to one plus p. Pz over two pi z pi z pi z over two times one over four sum over l and n up to two n of a l h l n a n plus plus one minus pi z over 2, 1 over 4, sum ln from 1 to 2n, a l h minus ln a n, where pi z is the product from j 1 to 2n, or to the 2n of sigma j z. Uh, like something. Can I can I erase here? You have the definitions. So what is what is H? I introduced this kind of uh, calligraphic H, and H plus minus is a matrix and it's even by zero h minus h zero 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 one zero and there is two ij two ij zero zero no zero minus one 0, 0, 0, h, minus h, 0, 0, h, minus h, 0, 0, h, minus h, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. Zero. Okay, okay, everything is zero. Zero. Okay. Zero. Zero minus one. Zero zero. Zero zero one zero. And everything here is zero. And everything here is zero. Here everything is zero. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
Okay, some uh, some current. So yeah. Okay, here all the all the block elements are equal on the diagonal and are equal to zero h minus h zero. Hmm? And now if you consider the other diagonals, block diagonals, two by two blocks, you have that oh you see also these elements are equal. Oh now another color, sorry. Uh, they are equal to each other. And are equal to zero, zero, one, zero, and also this element is equal. Hmm? And then finally you have the last one, which is this one. Which are equal. So it's exactly the same as in the uh, in the harmonic oscillator. The structure similar, at least not exactly, but you see that the, it has kind of a circular structure as before. So you find the main diagram, the other diagram, and these elements are equal to this one, like in the harmonic chain. And here, these elements are equal to this one, like in the harmonic chain. But now, instead uh, uh, of, uh, of having just uh, uh, entries of the matrix, we have blocks, two by two blocks. This is called in the indeed maybe you can guess the name. The the previous matrix was a circulant matrix. This is called the block circulant matrix. Ah, sorry, you're right. Uh, I forgot this. Um, the difference is that uh, depending on the uh, that was nice. Last night, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. There is a, indeed there is a difference with respect to the harmonic chain. <laughs> but here you have plus minus, and here you have, you have minus plus. Okay, there is indeed a small difference. Hmm? Sorry. Yes. Ah, it's uh, okay. H plus minus well, equal to IJ times everything else. Okay. Okay, I, I always show you the matrix and then I write it explicitly within this, but just because so you understand maybe well, oh, uh, the, the structure of the matrix. Yeah. And uh, okay, it's late, but uh, what I want to tell you is that, uh, like in uh, circular mat circular ma cir circular matrices are diagonalized by the Fourier modes, so you can expect the same here because it, you have the same structure, just that they, instead of diagonalizing the entire matrix, you are just you can block diagonalize the matrix. So if you now write here, you you go in Fourier transform. Hmm? Now you could expect that you, you still have to diagonalize two by two matrices. So you can get rid of this big matrix by using the periodicity, like before. But now you will have also some, uh, some structure, some two by two structure, which remains. Okay, this is just to tell you. Then uh, another, the issue of the sign here. There is indeed a difference now, because in the harmonic oscillator we had a, a indeed block circulant or anti. We have this kind of circular structure that the these elements was exactly equal to this one. Now we are the case, the case of minus, where you find the structure with a minus sign. But then you have also uh, another matrix where you have the wrong sign. The wrong sign is called anti-circular matrix. It means that when it's like when you put instead of periodic boundary conditions in a problem, you put anti-periodic. So the, the elements n plus one is equal minus the first element. All different. So these are two, two different uh, kind of matrices, which are simple matrices because can be diagonalized easily. Okay. And then I'll uh, I'll tell you how to do this, and uh, next time we'll do, we'll finish the recalculation. Because I think it's time. Uh, no?